how's everyone's cube day going? Is everyone enjoying it? Having fun? Seeing some reluctant nods, maybe time for coffee uh, boost before the end of the day? Good, I stand between you and coffee. Uh, I've got half an hour to either give you a greater desire to have more coffee or wake you up. Either all, we're gonna find out, but I won't keep you too long, I promise. Um, welcome to our, my session, building and operating cloud native platforms with Radius. Um, who has heard of Radius before? Who has heard of a different kind of Radius before? Fantastic, awesome. No, I love this conversation because um, Radius essentially is a, a CNCF sandbox project created by the Microsoft Incubations team. So there's a team inside Azure Engineering called um, Azure Incubations team. And they are the brains behind Dapper. Um, who's heard of Dapper, like the CNCF version? Okay, who's heard of the other kind of Dapper as well? Couple of hands up as well. Yeah, so they've got a bit of form, um, but I will explain what the CNCF um, radius is uh, and hopefully uh, inspire all of you to go and um, explore it because it's a really cool um, project that's now in sandbox for CNCF. Um, and uh, hopefully I can share my passion with it, you, with passion for it with you all today and get my words out at the same time. So who am I? I am a lead software engineer at Mantle Group. Uh, I am based in Melbourne, a Microsoft Azure MVP. I used to work and live in Auckland, New Zealand. I've been in Melbourne now for just over a year. Um, love Melbourne, it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm a community organizer. I organize a couple of meetups. Uh, do a lot of public speaking as well. My background is .NET development and Azure. I've spent a lot of time um, in the Microsoft ecosystem, just, you know, by design, um, not really by design, sorry, just, you know, that's the, the work I could get. Um, uh, I've worked in various types of industries, so banking, uh, agriculture, lived in New Zealand, you're about, you're bound to meet a couple of farmers, um, but I do a bit of consulting now for Mantle Group, uh, focusing on software engineering, platform engineering, um, all kinds of cool things. Uh, before we get started, can I just ask who am I really talking to with the audience? So put your hand up if you identify as like a platform engineer. Couple of hands. Um, DevOps engineer, if there's a difference, if you believe there's a difference. No, a few hands up. Software engineers as well. How about tech enthusiasts? All hands should be up. We all love this, right? No? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm actually gonna talk about today, I'm gonna to talk uh, what Radius is, explain what Radius is, and then I'll go through some concepts uh, that are related to Radius. So applications, what do recipes mean? What do environments mean for Radius? And then I'll show a very simple, very straightforward demo to kind of um, bring these concepts to life and we can understand how the moving parts work in the Radius project. So why is building and running cloud-native applications hard? How many of you would say that, yeah, we're running cloud-native architectures and, and applications in production or you're developing, starting out Greenfield? Okay, not too many hands. I would expect more at a cloud-native conference, but that's fine. So first things first, architectures are quite complex. So typically when we talk about cloud-native applications, we think of microservices, containers, serverless architectures, and for better or for worse, they all add kind of layers of complexity. Each component is loosely coupled, but have to work together in a seamless manner. Uh, so designing the interactions, making sure they communicate with each other, um, that can be a bit of a challenge as your architecture becomes more complex. Managing dependencies, versioning APIs, all of these issues. Understanding distributed systems and cloud-native architectures requires a specific skill. Then cross-platform portability. How many of you are deploying across various different clouds, not just one? Couple of hands. It's challenging, right? Knowing the differences between different clouds, um, even if you're working in hybrid environments. Any hybrid? No? Oh, a couple of hands as well, so on-prem and, and, and in, in the cloud. Now, Kubernetes and containerization can help abstract some of these differences between clouds and on-prem um, systems um, and managing um, configurations, but managing those configurations across different environments, that's still a bit of a challenge. And each platform has kind of like little differences, little nuances in terms of networking, in terms of storaging, in terms of security, which kind of adds to the complexity as well. So multi-cloud architectures is one I tend to avoid if I can, but you know, sometimes we're not given that luxury and sometimes you know, we have to work between the differences between different clouds, which adds to, adds to the fun and complexity. 
And then enforcing best practices. We all want to you know, make sure that we're building best practice and we don't introduce technical debt, but uh, you know, we're all under the pump with pressures from stakeholders, our customers, clients, etc. It's not always straightforward implementing things like 12-factor app morphology, um, infrastructure code, immutable infrastructure, all of these wonderful things that makes our life so much easier. You know, it's, it's difficult to enforce these best practices. And then automating that so it's implicit and it, when we're empowering our developer teams to build applications, they don't have to worry about all of this. They can just get on with building their applications. This is also hard because this requires tools, processes, and also cultural changes as well. How many of you have been involved with customers or clients or even your own team members who are kind of stuck in their own ways and they don't want to change? And you know, because it's, you know, it is challenging. You have empathy for those people because it does take a lot of effort um, to change the way that you think and the way you do things. And ensuring governance and security, compliance, cost optimization, all of these things, these require careful planning and monitoring. It's not just a case of just implementing it in a um, Terraform resource or a Bicep resource. These things require careful planning. And then troubleshooting. So once you've deployed the thing, how are we going to monitor it? How are we going to make sure that when things break, we can recover quickly? When you're dealing with distributed systems where systems are running across multiple containers, different clouds, even different regions, anyone here working with multiple regions? Couple of hands, you brave souls. It's difficult. It's a challenge. And identifying the root cause of issue involves sifting through logs and from different sources, tracing requests across services, sometimes even dealing with ephemeral infrastructure. Traditional monitoring tools may not provide the depth or visibility to track that. And in complex systems, it's, it's a challenge. So there's a growing need for observability tools that help visualize and trace those complete systems. And understanding those systems is also a challenge within itself. Now, standardization on Kubernetes has been moderately successful for most enterprises. Um, but again, anyone who's using Kubernetes in production understands that this does come with more complexity than it's worth. And our applications don't just run on Kubernetes. It's also maintaining and operating all the resources in our application. And there are full-time jobs covering that complete aspect. It's not just one developer thinking, oh, I'm going to um, develop an application and just monitor it and maintain it myself. We have full platform engineering teams that look after applications. That's how complex it is. Those roles exist for a reason. So when you think about your applications being more than Kubernetes, there are things like messaging services, proxies, container registries, API gateways that we all have to consider in, as the overall health of our system. And we don't develop in isolation anymore. And we really shouldn't, because the type of applications that we build, particularly at the enterprise level, are usually complex. Uh, that requires developers, platform engineers, IT operations to all collaborate together to make sure our uh, applications stay up and stay functional for our end users. And this introduces another, um, another challenge for us because platform engineers that support applications usually, more often than not, will usually uh, lack the understanding or the underlining understanding or context about the architecture, while app developers lack context about the underlining cloud infrastructure. Most developers, when we're starting out, will be running um, an application, whether that's an API, and then we, we need like a remote resource to test against, we'll have a sandbox environment, and we'll just provision a Redis cache, not realizing that's the premium SKU, and our credit, um, credit card bill starts um, piling up, our boss's credit card starts um, going on fire, and then we get a phone call um, from a very angry person who's just spent $2,000 specific number I know, not from any personal experience, um, asking why we've done that just to develop a small feature. So really, together, we need a common understanding and visualization of what an application is. Different tools may use different components, or be different tools, sorry, may be used to deploy different components of your application as well. So a colleague of mine at Mantle Group talks about this idea of infrastructure as code balloons, where you have different tools and different frameworks to kind of deploy your applications together. It's just a glorious mess of spaghetti um, of scripts that just barely hold together. So here you've got a nice ARM template. Who here likes writing JSON to provision infrastructure? Good, oh, one person. <laughs> this is a big problem, so you might have an ARM template that kind of deploys something. It looks like it's deploying a Redis cache 
then we've got a bash script that's um, deploying the ARM template itself and then saying, oh, the resource group needs to be created. Uh, the resource group is missing, so that's OK. And then we've got our application as well. So there's a Helm chart that deploys everything else. And then, oh, we've got Helm charts, more Helm charts. And then, oh, there's another bash script to deploy those Helm charts. And it's all nice and, and, and it's spaghetti-like. And it's all you know, just a big tangled web. The implication of this, infrastructure as code balloons, they do cost time and money. So you might be there just stringing all of this together and it's all in your head and you understand it. There's probably no documentation around this as well, which is ideal. It's self-documenting scripts at the end of the day, except if you're the poor person waking up at two o'clock trying to diagnose what went wrong with all of this and you don't understand it. And it adds to the unnecessary complexity. So how can we solve this? Or how can we even attempt to solve this? Because again, this is a framework that I'm introducing to you that's still in its early infancy stage. Um, but here we can actually start to address the problem through RADIUS. Now, here's a quote that I've stolen from their uh, website. So RADIUS is an open source cloud native application platform that enables developers and operators to develop, develop and co collaborate on cloud native applications across public and private clouds. Doesn't that sound nice and promising? Let's dive into a bit of the detail. So the idea here is, or the intention is, that as developers, we can define our applications and dependencies, and then operators will define the environments that developers can deploy to. Radius attempts to bring application developers and platform engineers together, deploying apps and uh, infrastructure that meet both requirements for the application developer and our platform engineer. I'll go into the concept of this idea of infrastructure recipes, but for now, it's just really swappable infrastructure. We're using uh, infrastructure as code like Terraform and Bicep that follows organizational best practices and IT policy by default and really alleviating the burden from the developer. And then Radius applications are really the primary resources that bring all your services, dependencies, and relationships together. It gives you a single description of your application, which allows you to deploy and manage your application easily. And it, all, it captures all of this via an application graph, which helps us deploy and understand our applications a bit better. Radius applications are designed to be cloud and platform agnostic. So once you define your application, you can deploy it to any cloud or platform that Radius currently supports. That is Azure and AWS. Anyone here deploying to GCP? A couple of you. It's coming. I can't give you a timeline, but it's coming. Um, and this is great for when we need to move uh, our application between clouds or even between cloud and on-prem environments. Developers essentially define their requirements and dependencies. Operators can define their environments. And then recipes bind those requirements to appropriate cloud resources. So if you, from a platform engineering perspective, Radius attempts to provide a standardized and repeatable framework for platform engineering. It's really focused on enabling platform teams to create internal developer platforms with a particular emphasis on trying to make platform operations simpler, more automated, and more efficient. And the idea is really to help those platform teams help manage, maintain, and improve their overall cloud-native platforms and abstract away from the complexity of operating um, of the underlying infrastructure. So let's go through an example, and then I'll start to build out this example and show you how it works in a demo. So say we're building an e-commerce website. Always seems to be the go-to when we're, we're talking about example microservices architecture. We might have a container that talks to a back-end container. This is, say, your front-end. It's talking to an API. There's probably a Redis cache in there somewhere. We expose it to the internet via a gateway. And then the underlying backing store is a SQL database. So when we're developing locally, we can use Radius in a local environment for dev test purposes. So we have local containers. We've got a Redis container there, a SQL container. And then we're running it on, say, a local Kubernetes instance, maybe K3, something like that. Uh, and then once we actually decide, OK, we've mapped up our application, we've mapped up the dependencies, we've tested it using containers on our local environment, then we push it to a cloud environment. Um, and this becomes a Redis cache that's actually deployed in, in Azure, an Azure SQL database, and it's all hosted on an AKS cluster. And 
where Radius comes in, everything here that's defining your application doesn't really change too much. You're not adding cloud-specific uh, infrastructure as code, um, cloud-specific code to kind of deploy to that infrastructure. Recipes are there to abstract that and take that burden away from you. So if you think about some of the core resources that you have as part of your cloud native architectures, you might have um, containers representing various applications. They can be supported by standard resources. So out of the box at this current moment, um, there's standard support for Redis caches, Mongo databases, SQL databases, um, the Dapper framework, not the, the um, ORM, uh, RabbitMQ, things like that. And then you can deploy that to any kind of cloud or on-premise resource across Azure, AWS, or uh, Kubernetes. Let's dive into recipes, because I'm just looking at time, and I really want to talk about recipes. So recipes is a nice term that the Radius team have come up with. All it is, it enables you to have a separation of concerns between your IT operators and developers by automating infrastructure deployment. So as a developer, when I'm developing my application, I essentially select the resources that I want as part of my application, and then platform engineers will codify their environment to show how these resources will be deployed and configured. So as a developer, when I'm deploying my application and its associated resources, recipes will automatically deploy the backing infrastructure and bind it to the developer's resources. So currently, recipes support both Bicep and Terraform, and the Radius team have provided a bunch of standard recipes that you can use, um, but you also have the ability to create and register your own recipes as well. So if we use a specific example, say I'm building an application that's talking to a cache. As a developer, I can define my Radius application, and in that definition, I can say I want to use a cache, and I can define that as a resource within my application. What IT operators and platform engineers then do is then codify how that cache is going to be deployed and configured. So if we take this example, this cache is going to be an Azure Redis cache. We're integrating it into a VNet, so we need a private endpoint for it. We might want to enable diagnostic logging for the cache as well. So as a developer, when I go ahead and deploy my application, all I'm really doing is saying, I want a cache. That's all I want. I'm not worried about any of this. I'm not worried about the private endpoint, I don't need to worry about what SKU to provision at, I don't need to worry about diagnostic logging. My platform engineers have lifted that burden of responsibility from me, and they've codified that into a recipe that I can use to consume within my application. Now, I had a conversation with a couple of people before um, saying, oh, is this a little like Crossplane? So here's a slide I've put in at the last minute because there's no fancy graphics or anything. So Crossplane, kind of enables platform teams to build and manage their own internal cloud platform by extending Kubernetes. Um, so it really allows uh, users to provision um, and manage cloud infrastructure declaratively using Kubernetes. Where Radius differs, it offers, or provides, sorry, a standardized and repeatable framework for platform engineering. So it focuses on enabling platform teams to in create internal uh, developer platforms with a particular emphasis on trying to make that platform, those platform operations simpler, automated, and more efficient. I do want to talk about environments before jumping into a demo, because um, environments in Radius are essentially, they provide a landing zone for your application that's configured with your organization's best practices, settings, and also recipes as well. Environments encapsulate and also store configuration for the compute platform, networking configuration, diagnostic, or any other operational concerns that you might have. And you can configure environments uh, to vary across different types of deployments. So you may have a staging environment, you may have dev and test, you may have production. You can actually uh, configure your environments to reflect your environments that you use today. Again, platform engineers will collaborate with your application developers um, by managing the set of environments that developers can use. And then when an application is deployed, Radius will bind the application to the configuration of the target uh, environment and apply the relevant settings. So in my definition file as an application developer, I don't need to worry about the differences between different environments. So if you think about your dev environments, you're gonna have lower SKUs, kind of bare bones for doing some basic testing against remote resources. And then production, it's more locked down. You're provisioning more compute, more resources because it's production traffic. As a developer, I don't need to worry about that. I just define my recipes, define which, um, 
define which recipes that I'm using, and it maps to the, uh, your environment automatically. And this helps kind of increase developer velocity because the application doesn't need to change across your environments. Awesome. Let's jump into a demo. And what I'm going to do is just duplicate. Awesome. How is, is that at the back? Can you see that? Or do you want me to go in one more? One more? Better? Fantastic. Cool. All right. It's very bunched up on my screen, but that's okay. Well, we don't mind that. So who here has actually worked with Bicep before? None of you. Okay, cool. So instead of developing um, infrastructure as code templates in JSON, good idea as that was, um, essentially the Microsoft incubation team came out with Bicep, which is just a, a kind of a, an abstraction away from the underlying ARM API. And for those of you who have worked with Terraform, will notice some similarities. Uh, there's just no state file I have to worry about here. Um, or there's no state file here at all. Uh, so essentially, if I look at this, and I'll get rid of you actually. So when we define our Radius application, uh, there are a couple of core resources that sit within some certain namespaces. So this applications.core, there will be some core resources like containers, uh, gateways, things like that. They're considered core to any kind of microservices architecture. And here we can define, so this is going to act as my front-end container. I'm exp um, exposing that on um, port 3000. And I've got a couple of connections. So I've got other resources as well. I've got another container that's acting as like an API that will talk to my front-end. I'm just using an NGX uh, image, and I'm exposing that on port 80. So I'm configuring that as a back-end source. So when I'm thinking about my front-end application, I can define some connections to um, that particular application uh, so I can um, make sure that those two can communicate together. I've also got other resources as well. So I've got a MongoDB database, and then I'm exposing that on a gateway. So to deploy um, Radius applications, there is a CLI. So if I go make sure I'm in the right one, yes, I am. So rad app run. I'll get my notes out because I always forget it on stage. It's rad run app.bicep. So I'm going to go ahead and run that and just get some more real estate going here. So that's going to build my application. And hopefully what I should see is um, some of my resources um, or all of my resources starting to be deployed. So there's my MongoDB database. There's my gateway. My back end, it's all deployed, so my gateway's available. My back end container has been successfully deployed. I've got my MongoDB database, and then hopefully it's going to come in and deploy that front end. So once that's done, that's going to be exposed on a gateway for me. So I've defined my gateway resource, a lot of logs there, and now it's available here. So. No, I don't want to do that. If I just go ahead, click, copy, because I don't want it to own edge, no offense. And there we go. So there's my application. Now, this is the sample base image that the Radius team have come up with, so you can actually get a better understanding of how all the different uh, resources and recipes um, kind of connect together. But there's my MongoDB database, and there's my backend container as I've defined it within my infrastructure as code template. So when I'm adding items to this to-do list, I can say I'm just adding a test item. This is all being added within my MongoDB database. So rather than having to know the underlining specifics, um, underlining implementation, sorry, of um, these particular resources, all I've done is essentially called this resource or this recipe resource and added it to my application. where the infrastructure is. So this is declaring the infrastructure. So by default, the rest of um, the Radius teams or the Radius environment gives you some local dev um, recipes um, to, to deploy. So these are all um, pods in Kubernetes. So if I open up my terminal again, open up a new terminal, 
just clear all of that. And then kubectl, get namespaces, make sure I'm in the right namespaces. Uh, okay, cool, so kubectl, um, get pods. And if I look inside that default radius basic namespace, hopefully I should see my containers there. Now, to follow up from that, I will talk about this. Say if I actually want those, so I've done my local development here. If I wanted to go ahead and deploy it to a specific cloud, I'll use Azure as an example. I would register the recipe on, this, uh, on my Radius environment, and then within my resource here, there's a property for recipe, and just call Azure. Now, there's a lot of setup that you have to do. Uh, within a half an hour demo, it does take a bit of time, but what that would do underneath the hood, that would go and provision a MongoDB database inside Azure. So essentially how that works, you either connect um, or you register your Radius environment with a service principal or um, OIDC workload identity, give it federated credentials, so you give your Radius environment the permissions required to go ahead and deploy those resources on your behalf. So the the advantage of that is that you take that burden away from your developers who might go, okay, well, I want to go and provision that access, but they don't have access to an environment, a subscription, a resource, whatever, and Radius does that on your behalf. You got a question at the back? Have you set up the Kubernetes locally and the backup, or is it the So the Kubernetes cluster is in Azure, um, but there is kind of like a local environment, so it's all running kind of like locally using my Kubernetes uh, cluster as context that I'm port forwarding it um, or exposing it by the gateway. Cool. And then if I, so my application is still running. Now, if you're not sure how an underlining recipe works, essentially there is a way that you can get show, sorry, get the underlining details of a particular recipe. So I'll just shift N there, and I'll get some real estate there. I'll get rid of you. No, I won't. I'll run rad recipe show. Now, with recipes, there are recipes that the Radius team provides out of the box for local development, but when you start to think about your own environments, you're gonna have your own requirements for logging, but networking, storage, stuff like that. So essentially, you would register your custom recipes into your Radius environments. And then for other developers who might want to use those recipes, they can use this rad recipe show command to get the underlining implementations or details of, this, um, of the recipe that they're using. So here for my MongoDB database in the local dev, excuse me, recipes, I see that I've got a username and a password, default values already. But if I'm using a uh, particular recipe, I might need to provide values uh, for myself for my own application. And then this is just like a snapshot that you can see. If I go back into, go into uh, localhost, hopefully, fantastic, there it is. So by default, Radius does have a dashboard. So rather than running um, CLI commands, you can actually view this um, visually through a dashboard as well. So I can see in my environments, I've only got the one environment, but here I can see my applications. And now I can look at that, and I can see the underlying details. Uh, I can see my app graph dependency as well, so hopefully that will show me, yep, a beautiful, but very small, apologies, um, application dependency graph of all the different components or all the different recipes that I'm using as part of this application. And if I look at resources, there we go. So that's just a list of my application resources. We can also see the recipes that are registered in our environment as well. So here, there's a whole bunch of recipes that have um, been registered uh, by default. I registered an Azure one. I was trying to get that working this morning, but um, for some reason I couldn't, so I thought, nah, it's gonna be fine. But essentially what hopefully that demonstrates, if you have your own custom recipes, you can go ahead and register them to your um, various environments, and then your developers can go ahead and consume them. Awesome. Just go back into my demo notes. I love using trackpads, always good fun. Make sure I haven't missed anything. 
there, so showing the pods, and the, you can, yeah. So the add, um, the rad app a graph, so if I just run that, just to show you what that looks like from the command line perspective. Um, if I just go rad app list, make sure I'm using the right one, so it's radius basic. Radius basic, I should see Is that it? Graph. Uh, help. Okay. Ah, it's not N, it's A. Apologies. Fantastic. Debugging in real time. So what we should see here, the underlining resources that have been created, along with some uh, custom Kubernetes, uh, some RBAC um, resources from Kubernetes as well. So you can see that I've got an app deployment, whole bunch of stuff. So that's how you can view it through the command line as well. Awesome. OK. Just looking at time, I'll just wrap up. So current status. Uh, it's in um, Sandbox at the moment. So in April earlier this year, um, Radius was accepted as a Sandbox project. Uh, so it is definitely looking for more con uh, contributors and collaborators. The Radius community itself, so they're on Discord. Everyone seems to be on Discord this day. That's how I know I'm getting older. Like, I just, I'm, I'm, there's a whole bunch of things that I'm not using and I'm not on and I'm worried, oh, you know, I haven't heard about this. But anyway, there's, they're quite active on um, Discord. There's also a community call, so if you like getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to talk about open source as I do, um, yep, they have a, a community call each month. And they've also got some office hours where the team kind of ask questions, uh, answer questions from the community. If you want to find out more about Radius, um, again, check out documentation, but I really want, recommend checking, out them, checking them out on GitHub. So the dashboard, that's open source, looking for collaborators, the underlining engine, recipes as well. Um, so currently, there's limited support for both Azure and AWS, so the more contributions, the better. Definitely check that out. Thank you for listening. Uh, my name's Will Valida. I'm having a strange last name, means it's pretty unique across um, various different platforms. I'm on GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube as well. I will be hanging out afterwards, uh, getting myself something to eat, and maybe having a bit of a coffee just to get, up from, um, get over the fact that I was up at 5 o'clock this morning preparing the talk. Uh, but thank you so much for listening. <laughs>